A portion of this video is brought to you by Surfshark. Where there's tech, there's magnets. The strong magnets that generate their own magnetic field, also known as permanent magnets, aren't only on your fridge. There are multiple places inside your fridge and in your cell phone, headphones, and hard disk drive too. Permanent magnets are also a critical resource for renewables because the generators in some wind turbines and motors in electric vehicles, they rely on them to run. This is far from ideal though. Most permanent magnets are made from what are called rare earth metals. And these elements are difficult to mine, expensive, and not widely recycled. And processing rare earths creates radioactive waste. Plus the vast majority, over 90%, are sourced from China alone, which creates a supply chain risk. As a result, the elements most crucial to clean energy are ironically the most unsustainable. But what if we could avoid using them altogether and potentially make better electric motors? With his design for a permanent magnet-free electric motor, a Floridian high school student has just shown us how. And another company is using cloud computing to try to improve electric motor performance. There's some exciting advancements being made when it comes to electric motors, but how much of a difference can they make? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. In his own words, 17-year-old Robert Sansone of Fort Pierce, Florida has a natural interest in electric motors. And while researching electric vehicles one day, he learned about the negative environmental impacts of the rare earth elements used in the permanent magnet motors that power them. This sparked an interest in developing an alternative type of motor without rare earths. But first, what are these rare earth elements and why are they so problematic? Well, 17 elements of the periodic table are considered rare earth elements or rare earth metals, also known as REEs. And to clarify, rare earths aren't really rare in terms of crustal abundance, so much as rarely found in quantities large enough to justify mining. However, we're surrounded by rare earths every day. These elements are highly conductive to electricity and used in a huge number of technologies, from fighter jets to fiber optic cables. Glass and ceramics are another primary application, and they represent about 10% of the end use distribution of rare earths in the United States in 2021. Rare earths are used extensively in the automobile industry, whether in the catalytic converters of cars or the rechargeable batteries of hybrid vehicles. Some act as stabilizers in the process of turning oil into gasoline. And when it comes to permanent magnets, neodymium and dysprosium in particular are vital. In fact, according to the United States Geological Survey, neodymium iron boron magnets are the most powerful we've got. These magnets can withstand temperatures as high as 230 degrees Celsius. And they're especially advantageous in clean energy tech because they allow gearboxes to be eliminated in wind turbines and electric cars. And to put the use of neodymium into perspective, a single one megawatt wind turbine needs about 700 kilograms of it for the turbine's magnet-based generator to function. As the demand for rare earths continues to skyrocket, their concentration in the hands of a few suppliers is becoming more and more of a concern. The CEO of USA Rare Earth estimated in a 2021 interview that the United States would need to produce around 20 to 25 times more rare earths than it already does to lessen our near total reliance on China between now and 2050. However, rare earths production is costly, difficult to process, and has serious consequences. Rare earth metals never occur as free elements, but instead as mixtures and ores. They have to be purified to be used, and the process of separating rare earths can involve thousands of steps and massive amounts of harsh chemicals. This is made even more complicated by the fact that all rare earths require different chemical techniques for refining. Also, the ores and the minerals that rare earths are primarily sourced from naturally contain uranium and thorium. This means that producing rare earths creates a significant amount of toxic and radioactive waste. To make matters worse, products containing rare earths like smartphones, monitors, and LEDs are usually dumped into the trash and not recycled. Attempting to salvage valuable metals from this e-waste can be extremely dangerous to human health because consumer electronics typically contain harmful substances like lead and mercury. All these factors translate into the priciness of rare earths. Some elements like neodymium and gallium go for hundreds of dollars per kilogram. Others like hafnium and germanium will run you thousands of dollars per kilogram. And meanwhile, copper hovers around eight bucks per kilogram. So despite their usefulness, rare earth elements complicate our relationship to renewable energy. If permanent magnets that set EVs in motion come at such a high cost, then what are the other options? When Sansone continued his research to answer this question, he discovered that synchronous reluctance motors don't use permanent magnets. But the thing is, is that synchronous reluctance motors don't provide nearly as much efficiency or torque, so they normally wouldn't work in an EV. Now, motivated by the opportunity to use this research as a project for school, Sansone began a year-long quest to fix that. Before we get into what this ingenious high schooler did, I'd like to thank Surfshark for sponsoring this portion of today's video. I always recommend using a VPN when using public Wi-Fi, 
but VPNs can be very useful even when you're at home. A lot of online services use some pretty sophisticated commercial tracking and machine learning to apply very targeted advertising, and a VPN can protect you from some of that. Surfshark's clean web does a great job blocking ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet even at home. I absolutely love it. And you can even make it look like your IP address is coming from a completely different country. This can come in handy if you want to stream a video that's only available from a specific location. And one of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all of your devices, whether it's iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. Use my code to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Links in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to Sansone's discovery. To understand what Sansone eventually accomplished, let's lay out what an electric motor is and where permanent magnets come in. Electric motors are everywhere. If an object moves, chances are an electric motor is driving it. That's why it's no surprise that electric motors are responsible for 43% to 46% of the world's electricity consumption. An electric motor works by converting electricity into mechanical energy. When electric current flows through a coil with a magnetic field, a force is generated that in turn produces torque. Torque is what causes an object to rotate about an axis. When torque is applied to a motor, it spins. This rotation is then transferred from parts like gears to whatever needs to move, like a fan's blade, a car's wheels, or your vacuum cleaner. The core of an electric motor is its electromagnet. It takes the form of a metal loop called an armature, which once connected to a current essentially becomes like a big flat magnet. Like any other kind of magnet, it has a north pole and a south pole. These can be flipped by reversing the polarity, which really just means some control electronics are swapping which wires are connected to the positive and negative ends of the battery. In a direct current or DC motor, curved north and south pole magnets are opposite sides of the armature. They make up the stator, or static permanent magnet. The armature will spin to align the stator's magnetic poles, but when we reverse polarity, it continues to spin to align to the new north on the opposite side. Reversing the polarity back and forth causes the magnet to keep spinning as it tries to stay aligned, which in turn creates mechanical energy. DC motors have been in use since the mid-1800s, but alternating current or induction motors are preferred in 70% of industries. In DC motors, flip-flopping the polarity of the inner rotor causes it to spin. In an AC motor made famous by everyone's favorite scientist, Nikola Tesla, power is sent to paired coils positioning along the stator to produce a magnetic field in the rotor which is affectionately referred to as a squirrel cage. Don't ask me why. And these coils are charged in a rotating phase sequence, essentially creating a swiftly rotating magnetic field. The magnetized rotor then spins to try to catch up to the field flowing around the stator. This can be measured as the saliency ratio, which is how efficiently a rotor aligns with the applied magnetic field before the coils can change their charge. Now, because this process is called induction, AC motors are also referred to as induction motors. Enter Sansone, who zeroed in on synchronous reluctance motors, precisely because they don't use magnets or rare earth metals. Instead, they just use a charged steel rotor with air gaps cut into it. Just like other electric motors, the rotor spins along trying to align with the rotating magnetic field. But as Sansone has explained, what makes a synchronous reluctance motor special is its air gaps, which create an exploitable difference in magnetic reluctance. Magnetic reluctance is equivalent to magnetic resistance. Metals with high magnetic reluctance move more as they try to resist a magnetic field. Per Sansone's description, maximizing the difference between the low magnetic reluctance of the steel rotor and the high magnetic reluctance of the slots cut into it increases the motor's saliency ratio. Higher saliency means higher torque. Still, neither the torque or efficiency of synchronous reluctance motors are currently enough for EVs. So Sansone's goal was to improve upon these relative weaknesses in hopes of designing a synchronous reluctance motor that could compete with permanent magnet ones. Then, by switching to these motors, we could theoretically make EVs both more sustainable and cheaper. Armed with a 3D printer, steel, and copper, Sansone spent a year optimizing his concept for a novel synchronous reluctance motor. Now, over the course of building 15 prototypes, Sansone developed a motor without air gaps, instead of incorporating another magnetic field in their place. And this one tweak gave the exploitable resistance and saliency ratio of the motor a big boost, producing 39% more torque and operating 31% more efficiently at 300 revolutions per minute. And the efficiency jumped to 37% when the motor ran at 750 RPM. But any higher and Sansone's 3D printed plastic parts would overheat, <laughs> which creates a kind of a problem because one prototype actually melted onto his desk. Now, fortunately, this loss was not in vain. 
In May, Sansone received first prize at the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair for his synchronous reluctance motor, heading home with $75,000 for his efforts. And he hasn't stopped either. As of October, he was still working on the 16th iteration of his motor with plans for version 17 underway. We can only say so much about the viability of Sansone's design for two reasons. For one thing, he intends to patent his synchronous reluctance motor, so he hasn't shared specifics about how it works. And as Sansone points out himself, a Tesla motor can reach 18,000 RPM. It simply isn't possible for him to test the relative power of his heat-sensitive prototypes with the resources that he currently has. In any case, Sansone's story is an impressive story of what's possible. Synchronous reluctance motors are an upcoming potential pathway to addressing the sustainability issues caused by rare earths. Switched reluctance motors, however, are already in motion. Like synchronous reluctance motors, switched reluctance motors, or SRMs, sidestep magnets entirely. And they both start with the same letters, so the acronyms look kind of similar, and they both lack permanent magnets, so that causes a little bit of confusion, but they work differently. On a superficial level, SRMs function similar to three-phase induction motors, a type of AC motor. An SRM works by wrapping magnetic steel and copper with a similarly magnetic steel and copper coil rotor. That might not sound like it makes a big difference, but it really does. The magnetic forces exerted on the iron in an SRM's rotor can be up to 10 times greater than the magnetic forces on the current carrying conductors. And with no magnets or winding on the rotor, they're even more fault tolerant than the already rugged three-phase induction motors. So why aren't SRMs used more widely? Well, you can blame that on some significant drawbacks, including how loud they are. Though SRMs are powerful, they're not very efficient. They aren't as smooth as three-phase induction motors, they vibrate, and they display more severe torque ripple, or variations in the torque as the shaft rotates. And managing the charged steel components also requires more advanced control and monitoring methods than other types of electric motors. With all these issues in mind, Turntide Technologies is attempting to tackle our need to reduce energy consumption through its smart motor system. Using SRM technology, the company's system is made up of a motor, its controller, and the cloud. The system collects data from the different parts of the motor to determine the ideal motor speed and stores analytics for both the controller and user in the cloud. The idea is to ensure that the motor operates at optimum efficiency at all times so that no power is wasted. It's a big deal considering the sheer number of electric motors running at any given time. According to Turntide CEO Ryan Morris, if we were able to replace the motors in every building on Earth with smart motors, we could reduce global carbon emissions by 2.3 gigatons a year or what he calls the equivalent of growing seven more Amazon rainforests. And that's a bold claim, and one that you should take with a gigantic grain of salt, but the smart motor's performance in the HVAC system case studies available on Turntide's website are promising. In one pilot program, Canadian real estate company Ivanhoe Cambridge retrofitted the HVAC systems in two malls with Turntide's smart motors. These locations saw 38% and 35% in energy savings, and 79% and 64% decreases in motor energy usage, respectively. The British retail chain, Wilco, similarly tested 800 motors across 400 stores. The company saw 40% in energy savings, alongside an additional 20% in savings when coupled with building automation. Overall, when used in HVAC systems, Turntide's smart motors promised to pay for themselves in less than three years. Sansone's synchronous reluctance motor and Turntide's switched reluctance motor are great examples of when there's a will, there's a way. In Sansone's case, it gives me a lot of hope for the future of budding engineers that are out there. And even as we face the destructive effects of manufacturing permanent magnets, we have pathways ahead of us to help fix that problem. Rare earth elements might be ubiquitous in the clean energy sector at the moment, but they may not have to be. So you're still undecided? Do you think that electric motor innovations like these will make a big difference for EVs and the future of renewables? Jump in the comments and let me know. And be sure to check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll be discussing some of your feedback. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones over here. And thanks to all of my patrons for your continued support and a big welcome to new Supporter Plus member, Winfred Thies. You're helping to make these videos possible. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.